Hello, I'm Al Vanderberg, co-host of West Michigan Issues and Impact, and joining me today are Shannon Faulkner, uh, co-host of the program, and also Frank Peterson, City Manager of Muskegon. We're very pleased to have Frank as our guest. He's been City Manager of Muskegon for going on two years now. He's been in the city management profession uh, for about 10 years and uh, just uh, making some great changes in Muskegon and we're seeing a lot of great things happening and thought that that would be of interest to our regional audience. So Frank, welcome and uh, tell us, uh, you know, where did you begin when you came to Muskegon? It, uh, it's a great place, has a lot of challenges. I should probably uh, tell viewers that I have a, a long-term reference with Muskegon as uh, both sets of grandparents lived there. Uh, we operated the Vanderburg Fisheries downtown for over a hundred years. So I've kind of seen Muskegon since I was a little guy when they had one of the best downtowns in Michigan mm -hmm. and a lot has changed of course, but you come to Muskegon with a pair of fresh eyes and uh, you know, where did you begin and what were some of the first things you, you did as you became city manager? Yeah. And, that, and actually that, that's a good question because really one of the things that attracted me to, to uh, Muskegon was really the, the potential, right, that you could see when you walked through the downtown or when you looked at the natural resources and you saw the things that, that Muskegon had that really the community that I was coming from didn't have. You couldn't fabricate it, right? You couldn't, right. you couldn't, you know, you, you can't make Lake Michigan, you know, nearby your community. You can't do the things that Muskegon had. And at the same time, you can't, you know, you can't easily make the redevelopment opportunities available that were available in downtown Muskegon. You know, a lot of the heavy lifting had been done, whether you, you liked it or not. It was the downtown just seemed like it was in a good position to have some, you know, some excitement, some growth, some some rebirth. And so, really, one one of the things that I really wanted to get started on when I got here was to help understand what people thought about the city. You know, how they felt about the city, um, and uh, and uh, and to tell them the things that I felt and thought about the city as a new person, right, as somebody with fresh eyes. So the first thing that that I did was really started to engage the community. Uh, it was important to me to understand what the movers and shakers were doing, but also what the, you know, what the average citizen wanted and expected and what the business owners wanted and expected. So we did things like um, we had trolley tours throughout the neighborhoods that gave me a chance to ride around with the people that lived in the neighborhoods, but also with people that maybe could or would potentially invest in neighborhoods and help them um, tell me what they liked and disliked about their neighborhoods and gave me a chance to see them, but also tell them the things that I thought about their neighborhoods. So we did that in the neighborhoods, we did that in the community, like the business districts and things like that, and it helped really give me a perspective on, okay, what do these people think about their neighborhoods? Where, where are they telling me to look? You know, what, what are they telling me to see? What are they proud of? What are they not proud of? And it helped me give a good a basis for, for, for when I do sit down with the commission or when I have sat down with the commission and said, okay, these are things I think should be priorities for you guys because these are things that are important to the community. Okay. I love that. That is such a, a cool thing Neat that you approach, did. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, I love it. It's wonderful. I'm going to go off script a yeah. little bit and just ask you, what did you learn in those trolley tours? What did people tell you? Yeah, sure. Well, it varied from neighborhood to neighborhood, but like here's for an example. The first tour we did was, it, it was not in neighborhoods, but it was on like core, um, core um, thoroughfares. And the idea was, okay, let's see what people see when they come into town especially the people that are coming into town that might not have have a reason to get into our neighborhoods are we are we tell, is our is the perspective telling people to turn around and and, and go back the other way How do or, we present yeah or is it yeah. or is it telling you to come back in and mm -hmm. and we found that there were a lot of little things that we either a weren't doing or couldn't do or, or just weren't getting the right the right pieces together to do so for example it was as simple as okay why is this um, um, rusty fence surrounded this property, you know, this particular property. And, and what it led to was, okay, one phone call to, to one property owner and the, and the fence was gone. And he, and he never realized that it was viewed as a, you know, as a problem, but yet most everybody on the, on the trolley tour pointed out as in, hey, why is this big half tipped over fence around this property? What is it protecting? And when we reached out to the property owner, they agreed, well, it's not really protecting anything and doesn't need <laughs> to be there. And it came down and, and it was like a simple, easy thing that, that we got so many compliments on and still people bring it up to me today. Hey, you took the fence around, off from around that parking lot downtown. It was like the best thing that, you know, and it was seriously, we took it down and we took it to a scrapyard and, and it was that simple. But wow, little things great. like that, but also stuff like, um, you know, pointing out what people don't like about you know, certain vacant lots, for example, and come to find out, yeah, a lot of those vacant lots were, were actually ours, right? And uh -huh. it's not that, that we owned them because we were a 
you know, because we wanted to, you know, as Al probably understands, cities and sure. counties are obviously the owner of last resort when taxes aren't paid right. or buildings are torn down. And we had a number of properties that we owned that we just, we couldn't and wouldn't or didn't take care of at the level that we think that I thought they should be taken care of and a lot of the neighbors thought they needed to be taken care of. And so that led us to kind of change the way that we manage our own properties. So help us understand that, you know, we really should remove the leaves from those. We really should do this and that. We make sure they get mowed every week instead of mm -hmm. every 10 days or 14 days. And with, just with the idea that, okay, we'll invest in ours, but make sure that, that everybody else is investing in theirs. You know, you know, do, you know, set a good example. And it's very difficult when you're, when you're already short on cash, right, for, for normal things, right? Um, to turn around and say, okay, well, we need to invest $100,000 in mowing vacant lots. You know, it's not a huge return on investment, but it was, uh, it was uh, an image thing, right? It mm -hmm. was uh, an image in understanding that we actually care about our neighborhoods and we need to invest in them, even simple things like that. And you were listening to your constituents, so yeah. that's very important. Yep, exactly. Well, and it kind of establishes a better moral authority to enforce your codes <laughs> and those mm -hmm. with long grass if your own grass is cut, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So. so tell us where your focus now then. Yeah. Well, right now the focus really is, is on this idea of, of improving Muskegon's image, right? So, so we think that we're one of, the, one of the best values, right? One of the best values, one of the nicest communities in West Michigan. And we think, you know, it, you know I, it's obviously my job to think that, right? But, but we really truly think that. But at the same time, we don't think that all of our residents feel that way. We don't think that a lot of people that potentially could visit us feel that way. And so what we're, so what we're trying to do is, is combat that in a number of different ways, but by looking at crime and blight and business development and residential development and all these things, but also, also um, getting out the good word when good things are happening. So, we're, so we have this, this plan that, you know, that we're working on that's really designed to say, all right, this really is what Muskegon is. Now let's show people what it is. Let's help them understand. And it's not about hiding behind bad things or pushing bad things uh, you know, under rocks. It's about, it's about addressing the bad things but embracing all the good stuff and taking credit for and, you know, and celebrating and championing those good things so that sure. people will feel better about living here, potentially moving here, but visiting here, shopping here, and all the things that it takes to kind of make a community you know, strong, you know, strong, desirable, and viable. And viable. Yeah, how true is it that a lot of times we tend to focus on the negatives and not celebrate all the positives? And yeah. That yep. is a really healthy approach. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think in history, you know, Muskegon had probably one of the premier downtowns in the state, mm -hmm. and a lot of that changed. I, I don't recall the dates, whether it was the late 60s or 70s when the Muskegon Mall went up. Correct. And that kind of changed the nature of the downtown permanently. Some would say maybe not so great. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, due to kind of what happened with the economy, and then, of course, the Sternberg Mall and all these kinds of things, the Muskegon Mall ultimately failed and was torn down. And so I imagine, in a way, you're like a you know, a kid in the candy store because you get to actually get, have a huge impact on rejuvenating and recreating a downtown. Yeah. And it's exciting to see some of the things that have happened already. Yeah, it, it is exciting, and you know, but there, it's, it's exciting, but at the same time, it's kind of, it's scary, and it's a little bit of a, of a catch-22 because you, you're remembering that the buildings that are going to be built there are expected to be there for generations, right? In a downtown, you're not building a building the last 20 years. You know, you want to make up. Actually, my great-grandfather's building, the fish okay. market was torn down. That was built in 1911. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so, they, so they're, they, they're, they're meant to be substantial. They're meant to, right. to, to represent your community for, for many, many years. And um, so, so yeah, there's a worry about making a mistake, right? You know, there's a worry, there's a worry about, about uh, taking a chance. But, you know, I have this philosophy even really from downtown development for everything that we're going to try to do if we want to make Muskegon better. You know, if you don't, you know, take a swing, you're never going to hit a home run. You know, you can strike out looking, you know, just as easy as you can strike out swinging. But from my perspective, you got to try some different things. You got to be willing to take a chance. And, um, but, but when I say it's also a catch-22 is we got all this cool vacant land, places where you can build, but we don't have, we don't have the, the, old, um, the old storefronts, right? The old ones that are inexpensive to get into, you know, that, uh, that a young startup um, business that wants to sell cupcakes or this or that can just rent a storefront and occupy. You know, we're, we're at the point now where, okay, we want to occupy one, we've got to build it. And right, so right. you have the... The developers that don't that you know they're kind of questioning whether or not there's a return but 
the business owners, the small business owners, they don't really have the resources to put a million dollars or two million dollars into a building. So it leaves us in kind of like, a, I don't want to say no man's land, but in a, in a precarious situation where we need to get the right people in place at the right time to see any yes. major development happen in the downtown. What, uh, what types of businesses do you hope to attract? To the downtown then with yep. the, the with the yeah. challenge that you're facing yeah right so so obviously downtown you really need it to be a, a good mix of uses right so we want to see more market rate residential opportunities downtown uh, we want to see more retail downtown and the funny thing is those two kind of chase each other you know the retailers will tell you they want to see people first and the people will probably tell you they want to see retailers first and and so we're kind of chasing both at the same time but you know the goal would be to get some to, to get some nice multi multi-use types of buildings that have residential on, on upper levels and different types of, of commercial and office activity on the lower two levels. Um, you know, we, we definitely are, are looking for um, certain office uses just to get, just to have, you know, daily foot traffic, you know, every single sure. workday in there. But also, you know, with the success of like the two breweries and the restaurants downtown, it obviously shows us that there's, a, that there's an interest, right, for people to come downtown for entertainment. And, and things like that and and with that stuff we think that it'll ultimately bring more retail and, and at least an environment that is conducive to supporting retail. So I'm, having grown up in Grand Haven, managed <coughs> South Haven for nine years, in many communities along the lakeshore you have this kind of tie between, symbiotic tie between the town and the water mm -hmm. and yet in Muskegon it seems like it, over time there's been more of a barrier yeah. between the downtown and the water do you have plans to kind of bring those two things together yeah. more? Yeah, and, and that's a di that's a difficult one for for Muskegon because we're different than than a lot of those other towns. And that our our downtown is you know it's a ten minute drive really from the water. I mean it's you don't just you don't just walk out of uh, Unruly Brewing and walk down to Lake Michigan. You know you right. you know it'll take you an hour to walk there. It's not you know what I mean. Whereas a lot of these smaller towns, you know, it's great they have that cool that beach feel where the downtown and the beach kind of bleed right. together, and it's it's amazing feeling. But but a lot of times the people that are going to our beach aren't necessarily also going to the downtown. You know they're completely you know they're they're a little different. Um, so, but, but again, it is important to us. And one of the things that, that, that we've been trying to do to, to kind of bridge that gap is, is come up with the plans that make the, the trip from downtown to the beach and back and forth um, a more visually desirable, okay. right? Because right now there, there's a couple different ways really that you can go. There's three, two ways from the downtown, you know, through down Lakeshore Drive and down Lakedon, but they're not the easiest, easiestly traversed Routes, mm. right they're you know they're through neighborhoods and they're not necessarily they're through some even some you know vacant industrial areas right. and right. they're just not appealing um, and when you think of tourists wanting to go from downtown to the beach and back and forth you want them to feel safe and secure and happy and you know you want this this certain image right because mm -hmm. we're back to image again and and right now we don't necessarily project that image you drive by you know the vacant sappy or or, or you drive by the um, you know, mi vacant Michigan steel property. Right. There's a number of places you drive by, and they're in in different stages of redevelopment. But you drive by them, and they're not they're not screaming "Welcome to the beach" you right. know, when, you, when, you, <laughs> when you drive by them. But they're also not screaming "Welcome to downtown." Right. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to do things like we've worked out a new trolley route system um, right. with the county, where um, where the, the trolley now goes um, from the beach down to a hub in the downtown, and then and then hubs back into the downtown and back and forth, so that people can get to and from the beach with the trolley system. And then also we've added what we're calling uh, shopper docks. Last year was the first first time for it, but we have um, a marina that's kind of right, just right on the edges of downtown, in between downtown and, and, and the lake shore. And so where people can dock their boats and then walk downtown and vice versa. But also they can dock their boats and get on the trolley because there's a stop there and then get to Lake Michigan or, or into the downtown. And so it's just all these little ways that we can kind of kind of drive the people in. But one thing that people don't don't always um, connect is that we do have a small downtown in Lakeside, you know, that's that's not downtown Muskegon, but it's right. but it's yeah. a business district that's much closer to Lake Michigan. Right. You know, it's more like a mile from Lake Michigan, and they have things like little shops in there, and there's a movie theater, restaurant, and, yeah, yeah, restaurant, and there yep. and a couple uh, you know drinking establishments, right, is for people to. So there, so it might not get you into downtown Muskegon, but there is a there is a shopping aspect. And, sure. you know, yeah. that's kind of like a downtown. That would be equivalent to a lot of smaller towns, downtowns, um, but it's downtown lakeside to us. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we hear that there's a partnership with Muskegon Community College and the city. What's that all about, the impact? 
Well, that's going but on, yeah. I don't know if I would say, you know, partnership, right? Okay. We're always partners with all of our, <laughs> with all of our fellow, you know, nonprofits and government agencies. But I'm guessing you're asking about um, the, I guess, their campus expansion into the yeah, downtown. the Culinary Institute and some of those things. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So Baker obviously has okay. a Culinary Institute okay. downtown, which is great. You know, lots of students downtown attend that. But, but MCC is, um, as part of the millage that, that was passed a year ago, um, they're, they're opening a, uh, you know, uh, downtown presence, right? So they're going to have some classroom programming downtown in the old Chronicle building, which in our mind will help put more young people on the streets, oh. right? right. <laughs> and potentially more professionals from, from the professors and the teachers and, uh, you know, the office staff sure. in the downtown and just help build that critical mass so that you can see, um, you know, more of a, more of a need, right, of ultimately for housing and retail and all those other things we were talking about needing downtown. Having the bodies in the downtown really is what's going to help drive um, the developers and when they make their, you know, their final determination, that's a great place to make that investment. And so seeing MCC commit to and making that part of their, their bond proposal, you know, and their initial millage request saying, well, no, if we do this, we are going to be downtown was a key, was a big key for us because it really is going to help like, like guide at least some initial decision making as far as when people are deciding whether or not to invest in downtown in the next two or three years. It's a very unique anchor because as you said, mm -hmm. it puts a whole lot of young folks right downtown yeah. and professionals and great building block for the future. Yep, exactly. And, and, and a downtown feels vibrant when people are out on the streets, when they're walking around and when, whether they're young or old or, 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 or male or female, when they're out on the streets and they're moving around is when that downtown is really going to feel like it's vibrant. Right. So intergovernmental, intergovernmental collaboration in, in the Muskegon area, I uh, have to admit I'm not real familiar with uh, much of what's going on. What, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you work together with other governments on? Muskegon provides you know, water, right, drinking water to most of the areas in Muskegon County that do have uh, public water systems. Um, we're just bringing um, Norton Shores and Fruitport Township on board. Couple of um, good sized like users, switch. yeah. Yep, yep. Well, turn the valve, really. Oh, is what okay. Turn the valve. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not a switch, but we'll, we'll <laughs> turn the valve, and you know, upwards of 10 million gallons a day of water usage wow. that our that our filtration plant will, yeah. will service and provide to their residents and businesses, and and that's a key to us because one, it helps them keep their rates stable, right? Because they came to us at looking to stabilize the rates, mm -hmm. but also help us keep our rates stable too, because um, you know we were you know. You know, these utilities, they, they rely on, on volume, right? The more volume that, that you use, the more stable your, your rates can be over the long term for everybody. And so we're anticipating that this allows us to keep our rates stable and avoid some rate increases for, you know, for at least a few years to come. And also free up some capital, or at least provide some capital so we can make the improvements that we may need to make to the, to the system. But, but in addition to that, you know, we have a great, for example, IT department, and we provide IT services to a number of communities that surround us. Um, from a policing standpoint, we're constantly um, um, looking to work with our, right, with our neighboring communities, um, help where we can. We have a pretty neat expertise um, in our department. We have um, detectives and, and uh, neighborhood policing units and, and, and great groups like that that can really provide expertise to some of our neighboring communities when problems arise that we deal with maybe on a daily basis, but they only have to deal with once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's nice to be able to in interject and give some, uh, some, you know, some informal assistance you know it's nothing that we have like formal agreements aside from maybe mutual aid agreements but um yeah but, but at least opportunities to assist and work together and doing things like that and you're part of the county wastewater system too yes or? yep yeah. yep so we so there are things that we participate in that we're not say the lead on for okay, example sure it's like the county wastewater or we have a countywide 911 system that dispatches you know emergency calls to emergency service responders um that we participate in um but we're not necessarily the lead agency. Um, are there any areas you hope to collaborate in the future? Yeah, there are a lot of them. I think that there's, there are a lot of opportunities in our county to talk about, especially from a public safety standpoint, being that that's really one of the most expensive right, services to provide to a community and also one of the most vital. Um, it makes a lot of sense that we're consistently talking with our neighbors of how we can, one, help, help each other out to provide the best service, but also how we could help each other out to maybe make that service a little more affordable, a little more economical for for one another. You, you talked a little bit and kind of hit on what I was going to ask about next. Um, what kind of initiatives do you have underway to take on crime yeah. in Muskegon? Yeah. I'll tell you what, we have a pretty amazing police department. Um, Chief Lewis uh, came to us probably about a year and a half before I joined the, uh, the city. And he has been, you know, he has been amazing with the kind of uh, neat ideas that his, 
that, that him and his team, I guess, have, have implemented in that, in that time. Um, and, and one of the, the keys that, that, that they like to, to talk about is this idea of, of data-driven policing. You know, understanding the stats of the community, understanding when and where the crimes take place and what kind of crimes they are, and understanding what neighborhoods are having this problem and that problem, and making sure that you have neighborhood officers, which we have, that are dedicated to those neighborhoods and are allowed to be flexible um, and work the schedules they need to meet the needs of their neighborhood. So, for example, if we have uh, 19 neighborhoods and we have officers assigned to each of them, we give those officers in that neighborhood unit the ability to be flexible with their scheduling. So one officer over, a, oh. he might be able to say, you know, I'm going to work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday um, because the neighborhood's having this problem. And then, and wow. so we allow them, instead of having them on 12-hour shifts or 9 to 5, they essentially, every other week, they report in with their schedule and why they're going to have this mm -hmm. particular flexed schedule so that they can meet the needs of their community. Um, so they're Very like, creative. Yeah, so they're assigned to my neighborhood. For example, I have a neighborhood office. Officer, Officer Sunday, that he, he who was assigned to my neighborhood, and he'll go to neighborhood uh, block meetings, and he'll meet with neighborhood presidents, and he'll just <laughs> he'll meet with with groups that have things going on in there. He'll meet out at the LC Walker and understand when they have like, for example, a hip hop concert coming into town, and help understand okay what what sort of support are you going to need from us, and I'll make sure that the police department's there to support you, and then he can flex his schedule to be there on that day, even though it's not maybe a normal work day for him. Or he might flex his schedule to be in early in the morning, even though he's typically in in the evenings and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a big deal for us because it gives that it gives that connection into the neighborhood and gives gives that officer at least a conduit, right, to understanding what's going on in there, where the problems are, who the problems are, and then at least input into how to address it. Aside from just typical policing, right. Um, but in addition to that, like I said, we track our our stats and we and we and we think we do it pretty well. We 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 understand you know if you know when there's uh, say a problem potentially with breaking and entering, uh, we can understand where that where that problem is occurring and when it when it's occurring by looking at the data and instead of assuming it's happening at night right or or at certain times we can look at the data and say oh wait it's happening at two o'clock in the afternoon, um, and then we can force our activities towards two o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. versus versus two o'clock in the morning and and maybe focus a little more on the problem that way. Um, but in addition to that, we, we do a good job, I think, of identifying who our problems are and what our problems are, um, um, saturating the area with the police when we need to saturate the area with the police, and, and making sure that the people that are causing problems know that, hey, we're here paying attention to what's going on. Um, it, makes it, a lot it makes it a lot easier to get community buy-in, right, um, to make sure the community understands that we're here to protect you, to protect your property values, your property itself. And, and when you have that buy-in from the community and the trust from the community, it allows you to get a whole lot more accomplished versus, yeah. say, having you know, distrust you know, or, or a more sure. adversarial relationship. And, and the police department does a great job with that. They're involved in all these different, like, um, what do you want to call them, like social justice types of groups, yeah. you know, where, the, where the police chief gets together with, uh, with, uh, um, with the local pastors and, uh, and the church leaders and the community groups and just helps, understand, helps both understand why we're here, what we're trying to accomplish, and how we can work together to, uh, to accomplish that at the end of the day. Um, and I think the stature, the stature are proven that, that we're doing something right. You know, crime in pretty much every category is down. Okay. Um, That's awesome. Um, we're, yeah. we're really happy with the results. And we still have, have, have a couple of years really to get where we want to be, but we see that we're trending in the right direction. And it's really, it really puts a smile on my face knowing that, <laughs> that, that, we're, that we're actually, like, good work is leading to good sure. results. And, and so Frank Peterson moves to Muskegon and taking on <coughs> a really big city manager job doesn't appear to be enough because you didn't exactly buy a yeah. house in the country club district. You, yeah. you bought a kind of a grand old home right near the downtown on Jefferson Street yeah. and took on this huge reconstruction rehabilitation project. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh -huh. I, it's kind of a big thing to take yeah. on as a new guy. Yeah, the New funny, guy in town. Yeah, the funny thing was the house was essentially abandoned, right? It hadn't been it hadn't been lived in. I, I understand that there may have been a squatter or two in there, but it hadn't been formally. <laughs> I mean, lived in the way you know I, I I consider lived in different than squatted in, but right. it hadn't been lived in really in a couple of years, and it was just it was a wreck. But it, it, you could stand out in the front of it and look at it and say, oh my God, this was probably a, an amazing house, you know, even. 30 years ago, but the problem was it had been real, it had been um, used and abused, right? Probably for the by the last three owners, and maybe even the original owner. I don't know, but it looked like it hadn't been really well maintained since probably 1975. And when you talk to neighbors, you know, some of them will agree that it just hadn't 
received the love that it needed in all those years. So, um, man, it had broken windows and animals living in it and, and, and water damage throughout from the leaky roof. And anyway, I guess we just decided I could go buy a house in Bluffton, which is a great community, right? Or I'd mm -hmm. go buy a house in Glenside and stare at the water. But, but my, the way I wanted to manage it was I wanted to be in the middle of everything, right? You right. know, I wanted to be there. I wanted right. to put, have my boots on the ground. I wanted to get up in the morning and drive through these neighborhoods that I want to want to improve on my way to work, you know, not drive through, you know, the, you know, the more um, financially secure neighborhoods. And so I wanted to make an investment in the neighborhood. But at the same time, I wanted to prove people that you could, right, that you could take a higher income earner, or, you know, or a family and you can go into these neighborhoods and you can pick out a house and you can fix it up and you can make it work for you. And that's what we did. So over the course of a year, um, gutted the house, cleaned out. I wouldn't even want to tell you how much animal, um, um, Excess byproduct, yeah, animal yes, okay. byproduct. Uh, we cleaned out of that house. Uh, we went through, I think, 14 roll-off dumpsters of cleaning out stuff out of that house, and um, essentially rebuilt it. Put my heart and soul into it, all my extra time after work into it, uh, and um, and if I wasn't working on it, I was showing a neighbor through it, and um, just engulfed myself in the, and you know in the idea of of investing in this old mm -hmm. beat up house in the same way that I want to invest in what some people were considering an old beat up town, right? You know, we wanted to say, hey, wait, if it's done right, it can be the most amazing house on the block or maybe the most amazing house in the, in the, con you know, in the county. Um, and you know, I'm 99.9% .9 done with it and it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's problem is it was built in 1917, so it's never going to be done because by the time I'm done painting, then I'm going to probably have to start over and paint, you know, something paint, else. There's always again. something. Right, right. Yeah. So I'm never going to say it's hundred percent done and I know there's some work to do and I got to get the lawn put in, but, um, it turned out to be an amazing house and my kids ride their tricycles and bikes around in it because it's so huge <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and and you know if they're bothering me I can say you go play in this room and, uh, and they disappear for a little while and I cook dinner and it's just it's an amazing place to, to have a family and the neighborhoods is awesome and you don't you like you don't realize how great some of the neighbors are in these neighborhoods until you get in there and you live next to them and you go oh my lord how, how, I, how did I survive you know not living next to these people you know the Right. Um, you know, I'll give you like, like one anecdotal thing about the, the neighborhood. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a recently single dad and um, I got home from work like a few days before Easter and my neighbor's there and she's like, hey, I'm assuming you have the kids on Easter. And she's going, now, you know, you got to have Easter baskets and this and that and that. And I'm going, yeah, no, I think I can figure it out. And she goes, no, I've got it. And she handed me a bag. So I, I cause she wanted to make sure that my kids had Easter baskets. Just, she was worried that I wasn't going to think about it. So she was like, there's Easter baskets in here. You just got to give the candy to your kids. It's all set. I mean, what kind of, who wouldn't want to live in a neighborhood where people care that much about their neighbors? I mean, it's, right. it's, it's amazing. Now, do you find that other people have wanted to um, follow in your footsteps as far as rehabbing and, um, you know, doing, doing that to old houses as well? Yeah, well, I, I find that people, like, really like the difference that the house has made, okay. you know, and they like the idea of a rehabbing. But a lot of people still recognize that, work. that holy moly, that was a job. Yeah. It was a job. And the goal is to get people to be interested in doing it. And I think that over time, they will, but it's going to take more than one. You know, and I think I knew that going in. It's going to take a few people to kind of step outside of their comfort zones. Um, and when they do, then you'll see a lot more people interested in doing it. Yeah, what a great way to walk, walk the talk in the city of Muskegon. Frank, we're out of time today, uh, but it's been awesome to have you on the show. We'd like Thank to invite you. you back in the future as uh, you lead some very exciting and progressive changes in the city of Muskegon. And so uh, we really love what you've done and, and look forward to seeing more. Uh, thank you to our viewers for uh, watching us once again, and to my co-host Shannon Salgner. Uh, uh, we'd just love to do this show and bring issues of interest to our regional viewing audience.